Fantastic. Is yours. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I see we've hit the graveyard shift, so I'm glad to see <laughs> some people still hanging in here for the last session of the day. So I'm going to be chatting a little bit about uh, the Biffles Dry Landfill Site Community Reforestation Program, which we've been implementing in Durban. And yeah, I'm going to try and give you a bit of an overview about you know, how we, we came about this idea. So I'm going to go into the background, a little bit of context first of all. Um, because it's very important to think about context when we think about conservation, when we think about biodiversity, climate, um, what we do here uh, in the Midlands is going to be very different to what we do down in the coast. And even within Durban, you can see there's some very different areas within that and very different communities. You've got some affluent communities, some poor communities, um, areas of rich biodiversity, um, areas that are completely transformed, etc. So we need to think that there's, there's always around exactly where you're working and what are you trying to do in a specific area. Um, back in the early 1990s, in fact, uh, Durban started building an open space system. Uh, so nothing new, it's been done quite a long time ago. And we've now got that network of green open spaces in the municipality where we effectively are trying to protect uh, some of our important uh, biodiversity um, and, of course, the ecosystems and the services that those ecosystems deliver to us. Building on top of that, in the late 1990s, this concept of ecosystem services or ecosystem goods and services was touted as the big new thing. So, again, it's nothing new. And, and certainly in Durban back in 2003, we um, looked at doing a study as to how to value those ecosystem services to try and understand what are these open spaces providing to the municipality in, in, in terms of a monetary value which we could then take to politicians and sell, but also to try and understand if you lose all of that open space, um, what are you going to need to fork out to replace? Uh, so again, nothing new, and I'm sure you've heard lots about ecosystem services over the last few years. And I think earlier today, um, which links to my next slide, these ecosystem services, I think uh, Kevin Zunkel said it quite clearly, these ecosystems also have thresholds. And if you push an ecosystem beyond a certain threshold, you are going to, you know, it's still, it's still going to, you're still going to have a problem on your hands. You might have a wonderful wetland which you protected, put a big enough flood through that wetland, the wetland's not going to attenuate those, that flood water. It's still going to push through there. Um, so, the other thing that we need to consider is, yeah, going into the 21st century, we're looking at the peak of so many resources, natural resources. You can see here things like oil, natural gas, etc. And, and these are things as, as conservation, so we need to be cognizant of. We need to be understanding uh, as planning authorities. How do we think about the fact that you know, our economies are going to be severely impacted by this? Uh, you know, how, is that, how are people going to respond to that? What's the impact on, on our natural ecosystems that's going to come out of that? An idea then was, uh, came up around, um, you know, these drivers of global change. I think that also came about in the early 2000s. Um, you know, habitat fragmentation was a, a big one, certainly in our urban areas, the biggest one. Uh, invasive alien species, things like climate change all impacting on our environments, all impacting on areas where we live. Uh, nitrogen deposition is such a big problem. Uh, and again, it links to this concept of thresholds. So if you push an ecosystem enough, if you, you know, degrade it sufficiently, you're going to shift it from one state into another. Okay, so grassland with enough invasive alien plants growing in there is no longer going to be a functioning grassland. It's going to be a completely different ecosystem. To try and shift it back, um, is going to be quite tricky and probably cost you a lot of money and a lot of energy. Then in the late 2000s, late 2000s, I think it was 2009, uh, Rockstrom's paper was published to much fanfare, and Rockstrom had this idea of planetary boundaries. And what he said was, you know, effectively, a sustainable planet, we've, we sit within certain boundaries, and if we push beyond those boundaries, we're heading for catastrophe, we're going to head for big problems. And you can see what we've already done here, we've got, um, that's our rate of biodiversity loss, and you can see that black line over there, that's our, that's our, our boundary effectively. So that's, that's where we've pushed, that's how far beyond our boundary that we've pushed. Uh, nitrogen cycle, the other one, and 
there's climate change. We're just starting to push beyond that boundary in terms of what we're doing to the planet. Uh, in terms of our greenhouse gases and how that's going to affect um, our ecosystems and our, our livelihoods going forward. So we need to think about this. So I'm sort of building these slides up. There's, there's a whole lot of things we need to be taking into account and, and realizing, particularly when we start to think about our climatic future. And in Durban, that's uh, certainly a big issue for us being on the coast and in an area where there's already a lot of rainfall, um, where we're already having water shortages. Uh, because of our high uh, population density. So we need to think about the big picture. We need to think short term for climate change. Uh, you know, how do we deal with these big storm events? How do we deal with uh, maybe storm surge events on the coast that are damaging our coastline? Medium term, what are we thinking about in the medium term? How are we going to plan for potential increases in diseases like malaria if we get a rise in temperature and malaria spreads back down to Durban or increased cases of cholera um, and other waterborne diseases. And then, of course, the long term. We can't forget about what are we going to do really long term, you know, our children's children's children, because what we're doing today is really, in terms of our CO2 emissions, is going to impact the earth for the next, you know, 5,000 to 50,000 years. So, in Durban, what we're trying to do is put together, um, you know, a clear sort of vision around what we can do in terms of climate change and whether it's mitigation or whether it's adaptation and I think I'll, I'll chat a little bit about mitigation and adaptation to climate change are the two concepts we need to think about. Just as an example here you'll see we've already modeled different uh, levels of sea level rise to understand how that might impact on our coast. Um, you can see you can see a uh, lovely beach over there in January uh, after the the March 2007 um, storms uh, yeah, most of that beach had disappeared so, and lots of damaged infrastructure on the coast. So certainly something we need to be thinking about. So we've got a, what we call our municipal climate protection program and you can see there's a bit of a uh, phased approach to understanding, uh, you know, vulnerability assessments first of all, then looking at adaptation, developing a toolkit from which we can use to, to start tackling climate change. And then mainstreaming climate protection into the municipality. So that's cross-cutting across a whole range of departments, not just an environmental planning uh, department like ours, but other departments that deal with stormwater, uh, coastal management, uh, solid waste, a whole range of other departments. And again, I mentioned earlier this concept of short-term and long-term. Now in the short-term, what we're often seeing is these extreme events. Okay, big storms on the coast, lots of flooding coming down our catchments, um, you know, damage to infrastructure, and possibly interspersed between those storm events are, are sort of long periods of drought where uh, people who are trying to grow vegetables in their, in their backyards are, you know, struggling to, to keep those, those minis alive. Um, rapid damage to infrastructure is obviously a big concern in the city because if you get big flood events, uh, yeah, you know, bridges being washed away, etc. But then start to think about these sort of long-term events and these things that are more of a slow onset. And this is where we're seeing, uh, you know, put in there, these are the things that are possibly more insidious that we really need to be concerned about. And how do we start to plan for the stuff into the long term? You know, sea level rise is really going to, to push up in the next hundred years. Um, you know, every... You know, every month there's a new paper coming out. Um, I'm sure some of you are, you know, reading up about climate change and you see how, you know, the Greenland ice, the, the Greenland's ice sheet is, is rapidly dis disappearing. You know, Antarctic ice sheets, uh, the Larsen B ice sheet that's collapsed and, yeah, there's, you know, the, the um, sort of the number of icebergs that are carving off those glaciers in, in Alaska because those, yeah, the, the glaciers just... The, um, uh, moving much faster than what it was. So we've, we've got a whole lot of things we need to be thinking about and trying to take this all on board and see, well, how do we deal with this as a municipality and then think about how we implement that. And then you can, you can think, well, you know, what, what does the World Cup have to do with any of this? But the fact is, um, we've had a lot of people flying into Durban, a huge carbon footprint. So what we decided to do is to try and capitalize on this idea and try and offset some... Uh, of, of our emissions, our, our carbon dioxide emissions, and that's exactly what we did. We 
uh, motivated for a range of interventions to offset CO2 emissions. And the CO2 emissions were over 300,000 tons just for the, the World Cup that was held in Durban, that event, um, not for the other cities in the rest of the country. And one of the projects that we came up was uh, the idea of creating a new forest at Biffles Dry. Now Biffles Dry is a landfill site which is sitting up there. You can see it's just uh, west of Inanda Dam. That's Inanda Dam over there. And effectively what we've got out there is we've got a landfill footprint uh, and surrounding that is a large buffer area and what we wanted to do is in that buffer area which was all sitting under sugarcane was to, to, to recreate a new forest. So you can see here, this is a picture, that's the, the, the landfill footprint in the middle of there. All of this other area around here is buffer zone and within those areas there are patches of natural grassland which you want to keep there's patches of woodland, there's riverine forest, um, and what we effectively, we, we're saying, we're calling it reforestation, but ultimately our vision is that we will have a mosaic of natural habitats on that site. The area has predominantly been under sugarcane for probably over the last hundred years. Um, I think it started in the late 1800s, sugarcane farming in this area. Um, so we've started working with these two communities on either side. We've got a Sindhaswini to the north and Biffles down to the south. And the idea is that we work with the communities around creating what we call treepreneurs. And treepreneurs are people in those communities who are entrepreneurs and they grow trees. So what they do is we work with the communities and we've worked through the Wildlands Conservation Trust. Um, they've got a, a model which they've rolled out um, and we've brought them in as an implementing agent here and they're helping us with growing the trees for the landfill site. Um, effectively, we don't pay them for the trees, but they get credits for every tree they, they grow, which we collect, and then they can go and use those credits uh, at their local store to sort of an exchange for food and, and other things. Um, and I some stats here around the amount of money we spent and the number of jobs we've created. That's just a, a nice little pictogram to give you an idea of what happens. So you can see these people collect the seeds, which we help and we train them how to, to choose the right seeds. They grow them, um, they store them in, at their homesteads. We come and collect the trees with a truck. Um, they get a credit note, which they can go and exchange for some food goods. Trees are taken to a holding nursery and then ultimately planted out. And once the trees are grown, and we are already collecting some seeds of trees which we planted in uh, 2009, which when the project was actually started. So you can see that reforestation is a new concept, and it's it was a and it, it's I'll be honest with you, it's there's a lot of people who don't like this concept of reforestation. People have come to me and said, you know, that year is supposed to be grassland, or you know. You know, re reforestation, it's just not sustainable, um, grasslands are far more uh, endangered these areas, but what we've recognized is that this area did have significant amount of woodland and forest. Um, there are patches of grassland which we want to, to protect and look after that mosaic. But the idea of developing this model is that it gives us so much more than just another nature reserve. It provides a lot of jobs. We try to also ensure that these people have um, you know, we can help them to create additional work in their communities by selling trees to developers, etc., in, in nearby housing developments. Um, so there's local economic development from that perspective, um, there's social upliftment, uh, there's obviously the mitigation of carbon. So in other words, by growing these trees, the trees will suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and that will help to offset those CO2 emissions uh, that were produced uh, for that World Cup. It's not for the entire amount, it's for about 50,000 tons equivalent of CO2 that we're hoping to sequester on that site. And then of course there's this big one here which is called the climate change adaptation and that's really around thinking around how do we ensure that our local communities, particularly rural communities in, in Durban, can adapt to climate change because and we still don't really know what this means. You know, climate change is, is coming and it's, you know, it's big storms and we're already seeing it. We're already seeing a lot of big storm events in Durban. We're already seeing shifts in temperature. Um, we've had some storm events. So we've got an idea that there might be some problems. Um, and we're trying to, to be in it innovative and explore new models for how we can adapt to climate change in these areas. Uh,
looks like the sides are gone. <laughs> ah, there we go, there's one. Don't know what happened there. <laughs> okay, um, just as part of the, the program, we're obviously doing a lot of outreach and education um, with treepreneurs, the people that are, that are um, growing our trees. And for just as an example, yeah, this is where we sent a group of people, local, uh, particularly local youth who've grown trees, up to um, Ganey Valley where they've done some environmental education. And we do quite a lot of uh, this sort of stuff with the, with the community. We've also, because of the success of, of um, the original Biffles Dry Landfill site, we've also got reforestation happening at Inanda Mountain. I, I, had, I pointed out where the Inanda Dam was, and just to the north of the dam is a mountain where we've got some very interesting indigenous forest growing on the slopes of that mountain, quite uh, an incredibly rich ecosystem, uh, but quite impacted upon by local communities in terms of the harvesting of wood. Um, so we're looking at working with those communities again. They're now growing trees from seeds they've collected. There's trees being replanted into the area. Um, we hosted COP17 CMP, that's the big climate change conference in Durban late last year, and we decided to try and offset some of those CO2 emissions for that conference again. It's this concept of, there's a big event, how can we capitalize on a big event in terms of uh, securing funds to do biodiversity work, um, in terms of what we're doing for uh, advocacy to raise awareness within the municipality, not only with people on the ground and people working in the municipality, but with our politicians, um, and our general public. There's also a whole range of research opportunities, and I haven't really presented any specific research to the, today here. That wasn't my intention. But we have a formal, formalized partnership with the University of KwaZulu-Natal, um, and we are funding a range of research on different uh, ecosystems within the Tekuni municipality. We've done some research on the social side of things to see how communities around Buffalo's Drive benefiting from the reforestation program. Uh, we're doing some uh, in-depth biodiversity work, uh, looking at the reforestation on site and different means, different ways of reforesting the area and the success that we're having on there, uh, the sweet <coughs> species that we're needing to be used in, to, in order to to, to rebuild a forest that's um, representative uh, in the shortest space of time. And yeah, that's so just again to highlight if, if people in the audience have uh, links to research or know of people who are interested in doing research on these sorts of projects, I encourage you to contact us. We are encouraging students to, to come and have a look at the site. We've got a, quite a few people that are interested and um, yeah, so, and we've already got this partnership where we're actually able to fund some of the research, which is great. Um, as my closing slide, I'm sure my time is just about up, just to say the Biffles Dry Reforestation Project was recognized by the United Nations uh, in the Momentum for Change initiative. It was chosen as one of the top ten uh, global environmental uh, programs uh, in 2011, um, so, which is again... <coughs> Yeah, just a, it's, a, it's a pat on the back for us, but I think it's important to, to say that you know, we need to, to be innovative in our thinking, and I'm not saying we've got all the answers, we've got all, we found everything we need to find uh, you know, and understand everything we need to understand uh, in terms of reforestation, but yeah, let's keep working together, and if people have ideas they'd like to feed in, I'd be happy to, to hear that. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was for diversity, climate, and people. Um, maybe let us, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, appreciate all the five.